into that conversation, why don't you introduce people and tell people who you are and why you're an authority to answer this question of our research trials. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Kimberly Smith. I am an infectious disease physician by training and uh, my current job is uh, the head of research and development for a company called Vive Healthcare. It is um, a company that um, focuses on making drugs for HIV. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what I do. And so as the head of uh, research and development, I oversee all of our clinical trials. And so I guess that makes me a bit of an authority on clinical, trial to, on the clinical trials and you know how they work. And so I guess I can answer that question. You know, what you were hearing before the vaccines came was that, oh, it takes years to make mm -hmm. vaccines. And so, but then one pop, you know, one, two, three, you know, of them pop up and folks say, well, you know, something's fishy. The reality is, is that the work has, that has been going on in vaccine research for, you know, decades basically culminated in what was an, an amazing turnaround in the speed of developing these, these vaccines. And so all that, that they were saying about how long it took to make vaccines of the past is all true. However, you know, where we are now with medical technology, with really just how we have been able to sequence DNA of pathogens, you know, of viruses, it, it literally they, they could, they could you know, sequence that DNA, know exactly how that virus functioned, and, and basically send that information around the world within seconds because of the internet. Mm -hmm. And so you can send that information to the people who have the capabilities to be able to uh, take that information and turn it into a vaccine. And so the, the progress that's been making, I mean, that work on mRNA vaccine, that the Pfizer is an mRNA vaccine, and, and the Moderna is an mRNA vaccine, that work has been happening. And folks were you know, really excited about the concept, but it hadn't been proven yet. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the proof of, con the real proof of concept that you can use mRNA vaccines and they're, they're, they're cheap to make, they're fast to make. And so, so there's nothing fishy about what's happened here. It is the culmination of decades of of research that allowed for vaccine, this vaccine, these vaccines to be able to be developed in such a timely fashion. And I also remind people, there's usually a lot of red tape and bureaucracy associated with getting uh, protocols approved to do research. So can you mm -hmm. talk about that and how much time that could cut off the process because the government eliminated that red tape? Well, you know, so, um, so we are, as you know, well, Lisa, we are um, right now, it's 40, around 40 years since the first uh, case of a HIV case was, was reported, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so you and I have worked in HIV for a long time and have a lot of energy, a lot of passion around that. HIV played a big role in actually creating paths to accelerate drug development. And so, you know, those of us that have a little bit of gray hair remember the days when folks were having die-ins at the FDA. You remember those, right? Yeah. Because they were saying, you know what? It takes too long to make medicines. People are dying while they're waiting on these medicines to get approved. You need to have accelerated processes that allow for emergency authorization to move studies in faster, to basically review them faster. I mean, you know, so typically if you come in with a new drug, it takes basically 10 months for the FDA to review that drug. That's a long period of time. But if it's an emergency use, then they can actually do, they can do a, an assessment faster for emergency use. And then they, they do all the rest of the assessment, you know, along the way, but they can make it available much, much faster for something that is life-threatening. And so that's, that's essentially what we had here is that we have a pandemic that was, you know, really killing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And so, yeah, they did an expedited re review, but that doesn't mean it wasn't thorough or complete. It just means that they did it in a fa at a faster pace because they basically put all of the energy of the teams that review this stuff on this one project to try to turn it around faster than it normally would be. 
they put it at the top of the list instead of it being, you know, sort of on the list coming in, mm -hmm. you know, in sitting order. on someone's desk. Yes, it's sitting on somebody's desk. And it came, it basically went to the top of the pile uh, because of the urgency. And so, you know, it's, 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 I think it's a tribute to all of the people, you know, I, I, I always, you know, put tribute to the protesters who made things happen, who change how drugs get developed, how fast they can get developed, all that stuff that happened back then is what really set up these streamlined path, you know, paths for drugs to get approved. And so that's, that's basically where, you know, where this, where this came from. Yeah, so I want to make it a little more real for people around this time, this approval timeline. So mm -hmm. if we were not in a global pandemic, mm -hmm. and let's say you submitted a research proposal today for approval at the FDA, how long do you think it would take for you to get approval through the normal process? Well, so now the process is years and years and years Mm -hmm. Lisa, when you start from the beginning, right? Because there are specific things that you need to do that are mandated in order to even get to the point where you can get to a phase three trial. And though that is, you know, that is an accepted guidelines around the world of what you need to do in order to be able to move the process. But one, let's just say you've already gotten through all of that and you finished the phase three study and you have the results and you put the results in. That is that, that typical, you know, 10 month, 10, 10 to 12 month review period is, is what, it, what it typically would take. But like I said, they have these emergency paths, which is what this went through. Yeah, great. So the other, the other comment we often get is, well, these vaccines aren't FDA approved. And it's because I think people don't understand the difference between an emergency use authorization and an approval. So can you, mm -hmm. Uh, address people's concerns that these vaccines are not approved by the FDA. Well, so that you know they have they have an approval, but it is a limited approval. So it's emergency use approval. It's not a full approval. And the full approval will happen, you know, when they do that whole review that takes that whole eight, I mean sorry, 10 to 12 months. But they have reviewed it and they have decided that the risk benefit profile of that particular product is in favor of the benefit. And so what do you they, mean, the risk benefit profile? Right. So, you know, anytime you authorize a drug, the question is, is it is it more risky for a person to take it or for the, the world to take it, or is it more of a benefit? And and does does the benefit outweigh any risk? And and so, you know. What's the likelihood of some adverse event, for example? You know, if an adverse event occurs, does it occur in one in 10 or does it occur in one in 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people? Well, if you, if you have some event that occurs in one in 100,000 or a million people, then the risk benefit is way in favor of the benefit as long as you're getting a benefit from that, from that drug, from that product. And so that's, that's basically you know, what, what they put in place is they wanna understand what is the, the uh, profile of what happened to the hundreds of thousands of people who participated in the clinical trials. That's the part about the vaccines that I think is really important for people to know. These were massive trials uh, to, to get these multiple vaccines in place. They did huge trials. And so they had an idea about what was the likelihood of an adverse event, not in you know 100 people or 1,000 people, but tens of thousands of people that were in these trials. And so you actually had a good sense of what the risk profile would be. And so typically, for example, when we do a clinical trial, our clinical trials might include 1,000 people. And so we'll understand the particular profile in that thousand people and, and we'll lay all of that out. Well, you can imagine if you multiply that hundred thousand, I mean that thousand by a by hundred and have a hundred thousand people or data on that many people, then you know you really understand very clearly what is the risk profile of that mm -hmm. particular product. And the bigger the trials, the more confident you can be. These were big trials. And so you could be really confident that there weren't gonna be a lot of things that you missed. And it's notable that despite these being large trials, they had enough people to be in the trials in record time. So if you're trying to enroll with only a thousand people 
that could take you months or even over a year to get a thousand people. But in these trials, tens of thousands of people volunteered in record time. And that also cut off uh, the time, you know, the time it took to produce Absolutely. the vaccines. And that was altruistic of these people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 that, and that comes back to when you, you know, why, when you had the other thing you, when you ask people why they participate in a clinical trial, most of the time is because they want to, they want to help people. They want to, you know, they, 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 you know, for people who are living with HIV, they want to help other people that are living with HIV. For these folks that participate in the trial, they saw what was happening with this pandemic. They wanted to be able to do something. They wanted to make their contribution. You know, we all sat in front of the television. We're devastated by those numbers. We all wanted to do something. And so the people that, that volunteered as healthy individuals to participate in these trials, that was altruistic. They did it, you know, to help somebody. Yeah. I also remind people that the, the clinical trial process is not a new process, and it's the, the same process used for these vaccines are the same ones we use to test medicines, whether it's prescribed by a doctor or over the counter in the grocery store or in the pharmacy. So why do you think people are making such a distinction? They're not holding medicines to the same standards or they don't have the skepticism around medicines they might be taking every day compared to these vaccines, when the process for approval was, you know, it was shorter, but it's still really the same steps. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's so much misinformation out there, Lisa. I mean, mm -hmm. people are just absolutely out there peddling nonsense, just plain old nonsense, but that's not new. And so the stuff around, you know, people who are these vaccine skeptics, these vaccine deniers, people who have said vaccines are the cause of, you know, everything uh, from autism to you know, all sorts of things. They've been out there for a long time making people anxious about vaccines. I mean, mm -hmm. how many people do you know, how many of your friends don't get a flu vaccine because somebody has convinced them uh, that there's some risk or folks are convinced that they got the flu uh, after they got vaccine, right? And so, you know, people have been, have these anxieties about vaccines that there's some, that there's some risk. And, but it is, it's, you know, the, it's very transparent what the risk is, you know, that is laid out very clearly. And the risk is very, very low of any significant side effects. And so, you know, I, I think it's misinformation and that's why, you know, uh, your, what you're doing is so important because it's got to challenge the misinformation because, it, you know, we, we folks, you know, our folks go on and peddle it. And then, you know, if, if, if there's, if there's people of color out there saying some of the misinformation and other folks are, you know, perpetuating myths, and then that, that just leads to us not and get, not getting to take uh, advantage of opportunities like a, a virus that actually will save countless millions of lives. Yeah, and there are even healthcare providers, you know, they'll have on their white coat or spout their credentials who are speaking ill of vaccines. And even though there are side effects, the number of people who suffer from a side effect pales in comparison to the lives, the millions of lives that have been saved by vaccines. So, but you know what else has side effects, Lisa? COVID. <laughs> <laughs> COVID has some pretty horrible side effects. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I say it as a joke, but that's the reality is that, that, you know, people, people die, not if you don't die, if you survive it, you may have chronic repercussions for, for months. You know, we don't even know how long some of those long-term repercussions from COVID can be. Not to mention, you know, you put your family at risk, you know, your, your, mm -hmm. your own uh, family members who really will be more vulnerable. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 the, the notion that, 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 you know, infinitesimally low risk, uh, in comparison to the risk that comes with, uh, getting infected is, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make good sense. Yeah. So my last question for you is about HIV and the vaccine for HIV, because the other thing we hear, and I'm sure you've heard this too, how is it possible we have a vaccine so quickly for COVID-19 and we still don't have one for HIV? Can you just break it down, help people understand what we're talking about? Is it apples and oranges? Why, why do we have a vaccine for COVID and not HIV? It's very complicated, but let me just say a couple of points. One, HIV um, is, a, is a pretty tricky virus that actually 
uh, basically integrates itself into the, uh, the host or us, the human's DNA. And then those cells that have that DNA can actually just sort of almost basically go to sleep in the body. They just, they go into a, a, a dark room, they go to sleep and they stay very quiet for, for, for a long time, but they are always there. And so we know that we have treatment for HIV. People go on treatment, they can be on treatment and doing really well for years. But if they stop that treatment, that virus wakes up out of that dark closet and comes back out because it's been sitting there dormant. And so the fact that it integrates into the host DNA makes it a, a particular challenge for developing a, a vaccine against it. The other thing that is really important for people to recognize is that that you know, people have been been talking about COVID and these variants, you know, around the India variant, the UK variant, and and you know, so over the course of this last year, we've been hearing about variants, and you've heard about five or six. Well, the amount of variants that exist for HIV is at least hundredfold what it is for COVID, and so you have such a wide, heterogeneous, really different virus that exists in different parts of the world. And so finding a vaccine that actually works for even one part of this one strain is really, really tough because of all that variability. And so those are some of the, the, the two main reasons why it's way more difficult to create a vaccine uh, for HIV. That's not to say we won't ever get there. I mean, you know, some of the work on, on mRNA uh, that allowed, again, the COVID vaccine to, to develop so fast was work that's being done on HIV. And so could, will we get there? Let's hope so. I mean, you know, I, I, I want to believe in my lifetime that we could come to the point of having a vaccine. I also want to believe we'll come to the point of having a cure. Yeah, you know, I, I heard a story about Dr. Katie, the woman who actually started working on messenger RNA, the mm -hmm. mechanism for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. She started working on this in 1972. So it, there, there is a bit of a parallel. So focuses on making drugs for HIV. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what I do. And so as the head of uh, research and development, I oversee all of our clinical trials. And so I guess that makes me a bit of an authority on clinical, trial to, on the clinical trials and you know how they work. And so I guess I can answer that question. Yeah, but in sure. And before you joined the, you were at an academic institution and were in charge of clinical trials for many years. So can you tell us about right. that? So even before being in the pharmaceutical industry, you have a lot of other experience around research. That's right. So, I mean, I, you know, I was, a, I was an investigator. So I was, you know, the doc at the site that was overseeing the trials. And so, I, you know, I've, I've seen both sides, you know, the, the side as the you know, uh, the clinical investigator and the side from industry, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the really being an investigator and spending 20 years taking care of patients with HIV and patients with other infectious diseases and doing research in that setting with, you know, with the government, actually government funded research, um, you know, prepared me for coming over to the industry side and I, I think trying to do it the right way and bringing, you know, I think bringing some of the you know, some of what I've learned and some of my priorities, like around making sure that there's people of color and women in the clinical trials. I brought that priority to industry. I had it on the other side. I was, you know, I was the person who was fussing at industry saying, you know, you guys need to do a better job of enrolling women and people of color. And then, then I said, well, you know, if, uh, if we're, if we're gonna, sometimes, you know, you're gonna get something right, you gotta do it yourself, but you know, that saying. And so I guess that just meant I was gonna join industry to, to try to, you know, to try to influence. Yeah, well, we're hearing a lot about the need to diversify clinical trials. Why do you think we've, we've done such a poor job at that? Well, you know, I think it's a, it's a, a number of things. Um, I think some of it is that it hasn't necessarily been a priority of uh, either, the people who are sponsoring the clinical trials, whether it's, you know, sort of the government or pharmaceutical companies or whoever, they haven't always made it a priority. And, and so they've been challenged to try to make it a priority. And I do think that there's more of a commitment to do it now. So one, so that's one part, making it a priority. The other part is, um, do you have the right 
clinical trial investigators in the right sites in order to reach people of color in particular. You know, if, if you, you may make it a goal, but if you don't change the way you work in order to make it available to people and go to the places where people are, what clinics where, you know, where people of color are getting their care, then, you know, you're going to have, you're going to struggle. And so, you know, so it's, it, so it's the commitment it's changing the way it's working and then, you know, and making sure that there's enough investigators of color that are a part of clinical trials. And then, you know, there's also, you know, there is some hesitancy to participate in clinical trials, but I think that that is often used as an excuse that people, you know, that, 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 that black folks in particular aren't interested in participating in clinical trials because of, you know, mistrust of the medical institutions and all of that. And while there's no question that that exists, I think that, again, that gets used as an excuse when it more often is that people don't know that clinical, clinical trials exist and they never get asked or offered the opportunity. We've actually studied this question and for individuals who are living with HIV, who uh, were getting care at places where they, uh, in, where clinical trials were taking place. But you asked, we surveyed a whole bunch of black folks and said, have you ever participated in the clinical trial? And majority of them had not. Mm-hmm. And when you asked them why, the answer was, well, no one ever asked me. Right. And then when you actually asked the individuals who had participated in the clinical trials, what was their experience? For the most part, their experience was good. And when you asked them why they participated, in the clinical trial, they said it's because you know my doctor told me about it and and gave gave me the opportunity and they you know they trusted their doctor and so they were open to it. So, you know, give people the opportunity, get the right investigators, put the commitment in place, really have it as a high priority, and I think you can get there. Yeah, you know, I've been asked to do some consulting on this topic over the years, and my recommendations are. Always, number one, if you want people to be in the trials, you need to place the trial sites where they're convenient. So in the community, it's still not happening. And number two, a lot of healthcare providers, especially primary care providers, they're not accustomed to participating as researchers or even being able to refer people into trials. So why do you think that's not happening? Those two things. Well, you know, I think it's happening in some settings, um, but why is it not happening as much as it needs to happen? Um, you know, I really think that there has to be some some sort of incentive, you know, around really making sure that clinical trials are diversified. So, you know, on, you know, one thing is that if you're looking to do a clinical trial to develop a drug, there are ways that the government can incentivize the sponsors of the clinical trials to make sure they have that diversity. And that is basically saying, do it or you, or you, you know, you're going to, we're going to, we're going to challenge you around getting your approval. Or if you, if we, if we will still let you get approved, we will make you have what we call a, a, a post-approval requirement, which is that, okay, you, yes, we'll give you your approval, but within X amount of time, you need to do another study that actually includes the populations that you excluded. Mm-hmm. And that's in the case, that's the case already for women, you know, so if, if, if pharmaceutical companies have, you know, you do a study and it's 95% uh, men for an illness that impacts women like men, mm-hmm. uh, and then they will actually, you know, put that on you and basically say, you know, you have this requirement that you have to do that. So, why not just do it right from the from the beginning? And so that's uh, that you know that's I think so I think some of it is you know there there have to be for folks that aren't inclined to try to do it anyway. And I will say you know in my company we're inclined to try to do it up front. We have the commitment to do it, but not all companies do. And so for the ones that don't, if there was something that forced them, that pushed them down that path, uh, then you know people might move move more quickly. Yeah. Well, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being with us today and taking time to explain to people what's happening with randomized controlled trials and the COVID-19 vaccines. Is there anything else you want to say before we go? Oh, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Lisa, for, you know, what you do, getting the word out to everybody. 
And um, I, I appreciate it so much that I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here working on a Saturday evening just to be with you. So <laughs> I appreciate that too. All right. Well, we will hopefully talk to you soon. All Thank right. you for all your work. Thank you.